quick note to you guys, um, this video is going to talk about some pretty heavy topics and so if discussions regarding rape or murder or pretty extreme physical violence um, are triggering for you, then this video probably isn't the one for you and I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and click away, maybe watch one of my other videos or join me next week when we talk about perhaps maybe a lighter topic. I just found this case so intriguing because I had no idea that Pennsylvania had its own serial killer. Who would have thought? Can I help the fact that there's a giant glare on my glasses? No! Is it irritating? Yes! But I'm blind without my glasses, so bear with me! <sighs> Sorry. In 1992, Allentown, Pennsylvania was tormented with fear when Harvey Miguel Robinson, at only 17 years of age, raped and murdered three women. He attempted to kill two others but was unsuccessful and these two attempts actually led to his capture. He became the United States' only juvenile serial killer to be sentenced to death. However, Robinson was able to overturn two of three death sentences through a 2012 U.S. Supreme Court decision, which ruled that juvenile death sentence was unconstitutional. So let's go ahead and jump right into who Harvey Miguel Robinson is and what grisly crimes he committed. Robinson was born on December 6th, 1974. His father was known for being very physically and emotionally abusive to his mother. And by the time Robinson turned three, his parents had already divorced. Numerous sources I've read have indicated that Robinson actually idolized his father, which is particularly disturbing considering the crimes he went on to commit. In 1963, his father, Harvey Rodriguez Robinson, actually murdered his girlfriend. Her name was Marlene Perez, and he actually beat her so badly in her face and her head that she was unrecognizable. As a young child, Robinson's teachers actually recognized his psychopathic tendencies and said that he had a very difficult time distinguishing right from wrong. His guidance counselors actually stated that he suffered from severe conduct disorder. He was first arrested at the young age of nine, and he racked up quite the list of arrests by the time he turned 17, including burglary and resisting arrest. You can't be up there, honey. Around 12.30 in the morning on August 5th, 1992, Robinson broke into the home of Joan Burghardt. He initially broke through a screened patio door, and he stole $50. However, on August 6th, just days later, he returned to her apartment. On August 9th, around 11.30 in the morning, Joan's neighbors actually called the police because her stereo had been blasting for three days and she would not answer the door. When police arrived to her apartment, they found a bloody mess. Robinson had beat her in the head at least 37 times with a blunt object, and she was beaten so bad that she had obvious skull fractures. The police investigation revealed that she had been sexually assaulted and both hands showed defensive marks and this means that most of the injuries that she sustained were likely while she was alive. A semen sample was actually collected on a pair of shorts at the crime scene and this DNA evidence actually led to her killer being placed behind bars. On the morning of June 9, 1993, the body of 15-year-old Charlotte Schmoyer was found. She was stowed away underneath a stack of logs in a wooded area. Charlotte delivered newspapers in the east side of Allentown, and when one of her customers realized that her delivery cart was left outside unattended and half full, they called the police because this was highly unusual. Officers followed a trail of clues, first beginning with streaks left on a window pane on a local garage. They followed this path, um, they found blood, her shoe, and eventually came upon her body. She had been brutally attacked. She was raped, stabbed nearly 22 times, and her throat had been entirely slashed. Investigators collected a pubic hair, a head hair, as well as a blood sample. None of this DNA belonged to Charlotte, and so they knew this DNA evidence would eventually lead to her killer. On June 20th, 1993, Robinson again broke into a home in Allentown. This again happened on the east side of Allentown, and this time he choked and raped a five-year-old little girl. 
Through my investigation, I was unable to uncover this individual's name. I was not surprised by this because she was a minor and I don't think it's imperative to us understanding the case or investigating him as a serial killer. So I just want to be very clear that I will not be revealing that person's name. Based on the little girl's injuries, police believe that he was indeed attempting to kill her. He did not succeed and she did survive, however, she was brutally attacked. She was the first of two known victims that escaped murder. Now, I'm going to backtrack a little bit because the next victim actually came about through what was initially a home robbery. On June 17th, 1993, Robinson broke into the home of John and Denise Sam Cowley. That can be confusing. It's a hyphenated name. I will place it here. When Robinson broke into the home, he took the entirety of John's gun collection. Within days, John actually bought three new guns, and he did this for a very particular reason. He purchased them, namely because he wanted Denise to be able to defend herself, and this was because they had just heard about the recent attack of a five-year-old girl in their neighborhood. Not surprisingly, this is the little girl that we just talked about. On June 28th, 1993, Denise woke up to the sound of Robinson in her walk-in closet. Now, John was actually out of town, so this had to have been meticulously planned. She made a break for the door, and when she got outside, Robinson was able to pin her to the ground, brutally attack her, and rape her. Girl, you making an appearance in my film. He raped her until a neighbor turned on the porch light and called the police because they heard her screams. Police found her on the ground, brutally beaten, a deep cut in her lip. She had been raped, but she was alive. This was the second victim that escaped his wrath. On July 14, 1993, 47-year-old Jessica Jean Fortney was found dead on the floor of her daughter and son-in-law's living room. She was found half-naked with a beaten and swollen face with evidence that she had been raped. Blood spatter on the walls indicated to investigators that this had been a brutal attack. It turns out that this entire crime had been witnessed by Jessica's granddaughter, and while that is entirely disturbing and completely unfortunate, she was, however, able to give the police a complete description of her grandmother's attacker. Now, the Sam Kelly family actually installed a home security system following Denise's attack. And around 4 a.m. on July 18th, the alarm was set off when Denise heard a sound inside the house and the back door opened. The intruder, who we now know as Robinson, he was returning to finish the job that he had started, took off running. The Allentown police knew that Denise was able to identify her attacker, and so they came up with this crazy plan and started to conduct a sting operation. So an officer would spend the night at the Sam Cali home every single evening. And unbelievably, it worked. At approximately 1.25 in the morning on July 31st, 1993, Officer Brian Lewis watched Robinson attempt to break into the Sam Kelly home yet again through a window. Once Robinson was fully inside the home, Officer Lewis identified himself and told Robinson to freeze, do not move, you are under arrest. The two began to exchange gunfire after Robinson fired a shot at Officer Lewis. Robinson at that time was able to get away. However, the blood trail through the kitchen alerted Officer Lewis that he indeed was either hit or was hurt. And so they alerted local hospitals to be on the lookout. As expected, Robinson did show up to a local hospital and he presented with a gunshot wound as well as cuts and scrapes to his arms and legs. Officer Lewis was able to identify him and he was arrested on various charges, including burglary, kidnapping, rape, attempted murder, and murder. DNA evidence, physical evidence found at all of the crime scenes as well as Robinson's home, and eyewitness accounts created a very strong case against Robinson. He was found guilty of raping and murdering Charlotte Schmoyer, Jean Burghardt, and Jessica Jean Fortney. He was sentenced to a combined 97 years for his offenses as well as three death sentences. Two of the three death sentences have been overturned and they have actually now become life in prison charges. As of 2013, one of the death sentences still remains. So 
what do we learn from this story? How do we gain insight through understanding his crimes and who he was as a person? One, I think it is very important that we reevaluate what we are doing as a country to rehabilitate child juvenile offenders. Harvey Miguel Robinson was only nine years old when he was first arrested and his crimes quickly escalated. It was only years until his crimes escalated to rape and murder. But what did our juvenile justice system do to prevent these crimes from happening? I am in no way blaming anybody but Harvey Robinson for his crimes. He alone is responsible for the crimes that he committed. But what I'm suggesting is that moving forward, is there something more that our juvenile justice system could be doing to help rehabilitate child offenders? Are we rehabilitating them or are we simply punishing them? In this case, given his psychopathic tendencies, could he have been rehabilitated? I don't know the answer to that. Um, however, there are plenty of children out there who are breaking the law and instead of helping rehabilitate them, instead of looking at human capital and cumulative disadvantage, we are simply putting them in prison and punishing them rather than looking at how we can help turn them into productive citizens. The second thing we can take away from this case is we need to be more vigilant in our day-to-day -day life. How often do we put up our own blinders and how often are we so focused on our day-to-day -day activities that we don't really watch what's going on around us? How many of our neighbors do we know? How many of us are convinced that something like this could never happen in our community? This was a very small town and these crimes were completely uncharacteristic for this community. And while I don't think that we should live our lives in fear, it is important that we don't become so comfortable that we live in this you know, narrow-minded, naive headspace where we think, that's never gonna happen to me, that could never happen in my town. This could very easily happen to us, to somebody that we love, and it is so important that we open our eyes and take notice to what is going on around us. And with that, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and go. I'm sorry to end on such a heavy note, but I just found this case so intriguing because I had no idea that Pennsylvania had its own serial killer. Thank you for joining me today and I will see you on the next one. Bye guys!